And we've started talking about classifiers and, and we threw out a, a straw man implementation of a, a classifier and it, and it worked okay, but it didn't quite satisfy everything uh, that we'd really like to get out of a classifier and associated algorithm. So in particular, one of the things that we really wanted to get was to have a smooth relationship between the parameters and the cost. And what I mean by that is that as we change a parameter a little bit, one of the Ws, a, a tiny bit, then we would like that E, that error metric, to be changing continuously. I, and, and another way to say that more formally is that we want uh, this function to be differentiable with respect to the parameters. And the other thing that we wanted to get out of this is, is this notion that uh, if we have a dividing line that's, that's uh, already been placed uh, amongst our training set, we'd really like to be able to distinguish dividing lines that are very near uh, the, our training set examples and dividing lines that are further away from them. So let's do a little bit of motivation first on the drawing side of things before we start talking more about the mathematics. Okay, so we have uh, our line that we were looking at before. So this is the f of x is minus x0 plus x1 minus uh, 1. And uh, this line here that's in green, that is that corresponds to f of x is equal to 0. Now, if I, now imagine I draw in another line here. Let's do a red one here, and we'll drop, drop the line right along here. If we take one of those points, so this is parallel to our green line. If I take one of those points, like uh, this point right here, x0 and x1 are the same. Uh, they're both 2, which means that f of x would actually be equal to negative 1 for that particular point. And in fact, any of the points along this line it, this is true, and, and you're welcome to go check that. So f of x is equal to 1 for all of those points. And let's take another step out. We'll go from here. And all of the points along the purple also uh, have the same f of x. And that turns out to be uh, equal to negative 2, and, and et cetera. So I'll draw in one more line here. And uh, that line corresponds to f of x is equal to uh, negative 3. So, so in some sense, uh, one can think of f of x as a measure of distance as to how far we are away from the green line. So f of x on the green, it's all 0. So we have 0 distance. f of x, uh, is e f of x along the red line is, is negative 1. Now this distance metric is uh, quite useful because it allows us to uh, say how far away we are from the green line. Uh, and, and when we're very near the green line, distance really does matter. Uh, if I'm near the green line, I really want to push that green line away so, so that it's far away from my negative examples or my positive examples. But, but for examples, that are sitting, uh, say, uh, out here. So that, that corresponded to an example that sits right here. So f of x is very near 0 for that negative example right there. Um, so it might be 0.5 or, or so. Uh, but for, for a neg negative example that's sitting out uh, here, f of x is something on the order of uh, negative 10 or so. And uh, we'd like to be able to make a nice distinction between uh, this point here being near the green line versus another point that's a little bit closer to the red line. Th those are important distinctions to make. But small changes in position of training points, say, out uh, in this far uh, lower right-hand corner, it really doesn't matter. These are both very far away from the green line. And, and we should treat them as the same. So, so what we're going to do is add an extra level of nonlinearity into, uh, into this process. Uh, our dividing curve is still going to be a line, 
Um, but we're going to set up our cost function so that it's uh, smooth in the parameter space and it captures these distances really near the dividing line, but it doesn't really care about uh, points that are far away from the dividing line. I'm going to define here something called a sigmoid function. And we'll call that uh, G and we have some Y coming in. This Y is just a scalar. And the, so Y is just a scalar. And we're, we're going to define this G of Y as uh, this ratio here, one over one plus E to the minus Y. And so let's, let's throw a few values in here. So Y and G of Y, uh, one can sit down with Python uh, or a calculator. You can define this function in Python uh, if you'd like. Uh, for Y is equal to zero, then G is equal to one half. For Y of one, G is at 0 0.731 plus other digits. For two, we're at 0 0.881. Uh, and, and as y tend toward, tends toward infinity, g of y tends toward one. Working in the opposite direction, a y of negative one corresponds to a g of 0 0.26. And, uh, and it turns out it's symmetric if, if uh, y tends towards negative infinity, then g of y tends toward zero. So let's, let's plot this out. And it'll give you a little bit more intuition. So this is our y here, uh, zero, one, two, et cetera. And this is g of y, and we will call uh, we'll call this zero here, zero point five here, and one at this level here. So y of zero we said is zero point five, y of one is uh, sitting at zero point seven three, and it turns out on the other side y of negative one is uh, just a little it is symmetric, and then two is point eight eight. So that sits, sits right, uh, right about here. And likewise, right about there. Um, so, so in this region here, this, this function turns out to be relatively linear. But, but as we start getting beyond the, the twos and threes, we, we start to asymptote as we approach one here. Never, we'll only approach one in the infinite limit. And likewise, on the other side, uh, we approach zero in the infinite limit uh, as, as y approaches negative infinity. The, the, the key point about this graph is that small changes in y right around, uh, right around uh, zero, small changes in y translate into reasonable changes in g. But when y is very large, say y is out, toward five or six, a small change in y uh, results in, uh, in, 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 in essentially no change in g. And what we're going to do is use this as a means of providing a class label for our classifier, but we're going to do it in a continuous manner. So, so we had our f of x before, uh, and now we're going to combine this g of x with f of x. So uh, combine with f of x. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the, the value that we get out of f of x and pipe that right into g. And we know that g varies between 0 and 1. And uh, for uh, so for values uh, of of g that are near zero, we're going to call these negative examples. And something near one, we'll call those positive examples. 
but in in between we we have a bit more of a fuzzy notion of uh, whether we have a positive or negative. So let's go back up to our original uh, picture here and move our function out of the way. When f of x is equal to zero, uh, g is is equal to zero point five. When f of x is uh, negative one, then g is something around uh, uh, point uh, two six. When g is negative two, I'm sorry, f is negative two, then g is uh, point one one nine. And at negative three, g is equal to zero point zero seven four with other other digits there. So so the key is that by the time we get to orange, g is is really very near zero, and the and as we get further and further away from orange, and in particular we get to these samples that sit out uh, over here, g is going to be arbitrarily close to uh, to zero. And likewise, on on the other side, if I have positive examples that sit right near the green line, g is going to be near 0.5, a little bit more than 0.5. Uh, but as I get further and further out, at some point I get I get to a point where the, the G's for samples that sit out over here, they're going to be very near to one. And, and so this suggests uh, another possible uh, way of talking about error. And let me write it down and then we'll, we'll talk about it. And the, the idea uh, is that we'll define error. Uh, this is going to be a sum over all samples. So we'll index the samples from zero to uh, to uh, m minus one, so they're a total of m training samples. And we're going to compute a squared difference between y of i, I'll define that here in a second, and g of f of big X of i. And three parentheses, and then there's a squared term here. Okay, so, so x of i, this is our, this is our input. In particular, it's input i. F of x gives us a measure of distance away from our line uh, for, get for our given parameters. And then g of x, this is going to be, I'm going to put this in quotes, we'll call it fuzzy class label. And that, and that ranges somewhere between 0 and 1. Uh, the the term fuzzy uh, does come up in machine learning as well. There's a whole uh, domain of research called fuzzy logic. Um, I'm not meaning that in in this case. So so that's so that's what we mean by that g term there. This y term, this is this is our true label. So in our training set, we're given these true labels, and it's going to be one if it's a positive example and zero if, if it's a negative example. And, and then we're, we're computing a square over, uh, over those differences. And, and that turns out to be useful uh, from the differentiation uh, perspective. But, but one could, could go other ways. So, so what this error metric is doing is it's comparing the difference between the true label and the label that the classifier is giving it, and, and it's a fuzzy label. We're squaring that, and we're taking a sum over all of the training set instances. Now, if we have a, a negative example, then yi is zero, and if g is, if, if our sample is way off over here, then g is going to be something near zero. Uh, sorry, I'm, I did not come across very well. If, if our sample is sitting way off to the lower right-hand side of the space, then G is going to be something near zero. And so the difference between YI and G is going to be small. Now, if I happen to have a negative example sitting on the opposite side, then, uh, then YI is still negative. So, it's, so 
y i is zero, but g is actually going to be something close to one. And so we have a uh, that that difference is is near one. We square that, we end up with a one. And if we actually move that sample something close to this line here, we're going to be assigning a, a G of something near 0.6 or so. And, and we still have a real difference. It's, it's, so we have a, a zero minus 0.6, we, we square that and we end up with a 0.36. Uh, likewise, uh, for these positive samples, a, uh, a positive sample right in this vicinity here uh, G is going to be assigned a, a 0.6 and YI, because it's a positive example, will be one. So our difference is uh, 0.4 and the, and the squared difference is 0.16. The, the samples that sit up here, G is going to be one, YI is one, so, so those contribute very little to that, uh, that sum. And then finally, if, if we happen to have a positive example that's sitting down in this vicinity here, the G that it receives is going to be near zero, uh, YI is going to be uh, one, and, and so our difference is near one, and of course our squared uh, difference is going to be near one. Okay, so, so the, the key here is this error metric that we've been uh, talking about now, uh, no longer just simply counts the number of incorrect answers we've given, uh, but it actually uh, grades our individual answers depending upon how far away we are from the line. And, and of course, we have to be on the correct side of, of the line as well. So let me show you, this is a notion of uh, something called an error surface. And I'm going to assume here that uh, that uh, W1 and W2 are constant. And, and given that assumption, the, our only other parameter is W0, we can imagine varying that parameter and asking what E is as a function of that parameter. Uh, and, and if we had uh, lots of time, we could actually, we could actually compute exactly what this this surface uh, looks like. It might look something along these lines. Um, because now we care about how far away our, uh, our, our samples are from that dividing line, E turns out to be uh, smooth with, re with respect to W0. And uh, that means mathematically that it's differentiable. So imagine a scenario where where we have a W0 that's currently sitting right here. So maybe this is time uh, t equals zero. That means that our error is right here. And, and because this function is differentiable, it means that we can compute what the slope is uh, of the function. And uh, mathematically, this you could write this as de d w0. What DEDW0 tells us is how we should change W0 in order to make E go up, to, to increase E. In this particular application, E is cost. We want to make it go downhill. So we're, we're going to actually go in the opposite uh, direction. Uh, so, so we observe the, the slope to be this, which suggests that we ought to be moving uh, at our next time step. We ought to move W0 uh, to the right. So this is t equals 1. And so that puts us right here. So and indeed, error has gone down. Uh, at this point, we can measure the slope again, which nicely is, is bigger. And, and that suggests that we make a bigger change in w0. So we might now be sitting at here at time t equals 2. This has a slope as well, not as big as time 1. Uh, but it does suggest a continued movement in the uh, right-hand direction. So we might end up uh, right here. At this particular point here, that slope is pretty darn close to, to zero. And, and what that means is we don't know which way to take W0.
So the, this error surface idea is a, is a very general idea. The, the true space that we're looking at is actually uh, a four dimensional space. So it's E as a function of W0, W1, and W2. It's hard to draw in four, uh, a surface in, in four dimensions, but mathematically we can compute uh, derivatives along each of those directions, D, E, D, W, zero, D, E, D, uh, W, one, uh, et cetera. So this suggests uh, a particular algorithm. So, so here is uh, our candidate algorithm. Uh, and this is actually implemented for us in scikit-learn uh, under the heading of stochastic gradient descent. So, so we're going to first randomly choose our parameters, W, zero, one, and two. We can measure the error, and while that error is, is uh, too big, uh, then we're going to grab either all of our training samples. We could even grab a subset of our training samples. Uh, we can compute uh, D for those training samples, D, E, D, W, 0, W, 1, and W, 2. So we're computing the derivatives with respect to each of those parameters. And then we change the parameters in the direction that is opposite of what the derivative is suggest suggesting. Mathematically, uh, we're now in the realm of partial derivatives, so the notation ends up looking like this. So uh, for, for each i in our training set, we're going to compute, I, I'm sorry, for each i uh, of our parameters, uh, we're going to compute the, the partial derivative of uh, e with respect to uh, wi, where i is 0, 1, or 2. And then for changing the parameters, uh, this is the mathematician way of saying we're, we're making a change to wi. So we're saying wi is set to this difference here, the, the original value of wi minus uh, the, this alpha times de dwi. Alpha here is just a learning rate parameter. It tells us how big we are going to make our steps if we want to be super conservative, such that we're not missing little uh, uh, dimples in our error surface, we might set alpha to, really, to be really small. Uh, but if we want to take really big steps, then we can increase alpha to, to something larger. And, and that choosing learning rates is a whole other bit of magic uh, that one has to uh, experiment with. What's nice is that the modern set of gradient descent methods, many of them will actually uh, make uh, dynamic choices as to what alpha should be depending upon the, the local shape of the error surface. So we'll, we'll talk about that as we get further on in the semester. Just a couple of other notes. Uh, the this, this stochastic element of stochastic gradient descent, what that means is that we're computing uh, E and the derivatives using just a subset of the samples, and usually these are randomly drawn uh, uh, subsets of, of the training samples. And uh, what this means is we're spending less time computing gradients, uh, but we end up with a reasonable estimate of what the gradient is. It's not perfect, but, but it is reasonable and we usually can get away with, uh, with that shortcut. The computation of the gradient actually is quite uh, straightforward. Uh, the derivation of that is beyond what we're gonna do here in class. Uh, but uh, it is relatively straightforward. And furthermore, uh, the computation of the gradient is already done for you by Sakitlan. Now, I wanted to make one other point with respect to our training set. And for that, let's go back to our drawing. Okay, so let me show you another uh, training set here. And imagine that I have a set of positives that look like this, and then a set of negatives that look like this. And the reality in this particular scenario is that there is no line that perfectly separates the positives uh, from the negatives. And what this means in this very simple stochastic gradient descent algorithm that we're going to be uh, playing with in, uh, in Python uh, is that we're never going to achieve a point where error is actually uh, perfectly zero. Uh, we'll always have some sort of a, uh, a finite error. Uh, and, and so the criterion of waiting for error to 
get down to a small enough value may not be sufficient for uh, uh, doing our training process. So here, here is our uh, learning algorithm pseudocode. Um, this, uh, th this while loop here as, says as long as the error is too large, uh, we're going to continue to, to descend. A, a more realistic uh, type of criterion is to ask whether or not error has stopped improving. And, and we, might, we might look at not just the last step of uh, gradient descent, but we might actually look at a larger uh, set of steps, say a uh, hundred or maybe even a thousand steps. And if error hasn't improved uh, dramatically, then, then we'll drop out of this loop. But again, this kind of thing is built into uh, stochastic uh, gradient descent. So that's the quick uh, introduction to this idea of linear models. And uh, there, there are certainly uh, nonlinear uh, models for doing classification, and we'll talk about those as we get further into the semester. But first, I wanted to actually show you uh, these ideas in, uh, in uh, uh, real use. So we're going to do a little bit of work with our infant uh, behavioral data and, and do some classification there. 